It's on. It's on? Okay, I'll just show. Um, so I think I have to say that I'm kind of an addition to that conversation because you've been working together for a couple of years since Satan started her residence at Platform in 2008, I think, right? Yeah. So thanks for inviting me to the conversation. Well, the, the starting point of the, the conversation tonight is basically the um, sitting's ongoing and evolving installation um, surrounded by the uninhabitable that you passed through on your way here to, to the open cinema. So it's in the forum area, the ground floor of South Bay Oldham. That is not an exhibition space, and that's like situated between the street and exhibitions upstairs. Um, I was thinking of starting off by thinking about the relationship between the scramble for the past exhibition at South Galata and this edition of the installation, because basically this installation has um, or incorporates material traces of scramble for the past exhibition, the, the story of the archaeology of the Ottoman Empire from 1753 to 1914, um, because basically Sivin recycled some of the, the display structures that she produced for the exhibition, and in the exhibition, these display structures, they served as um, placeholders for the archival material that the, the, the historians for the exhibition, they selected. Um, so maybe we could start off thinking about the relationship between them and how we think about the idea of recycling between these two projects and what kind of a shift happens between these two. Yeah, first of all, hi everybody, and it's very nice to, to be here to be able to talk about the installation. Thanks for uh, the introduction. It's, um, it's quite important for me to be able to talk about this also because, as you say, there, are, there is a new installation that is out there in the forum, but it is also somehow bearing witness to several things that have, have happened before that are may or may not be obvious, and it's part of the installation that I'm interested in exploring. So, <coughs> surrounded by the uninhabitable, here is, again, um, the, <laughs> the installation that you see outside in the forum is only using as raw material all the structures that I already made for the exhibition at Salt Galata that was running from November to two weeks ago in the middle of March. So the idea is, on the one hand, of thinking about, I suppose, recycling, even though I never really called it recycling, I have to say, I was thinking of, think of using continuity within the formation of a piece so that you make a piece that is made of your work, but it's on top of your own work as well. Um, I have never done this before. This was really an experiment. Um, I'm interested in issues that have to do with accumulation. More than recycling, I really think about accumulation, the cumulative. Um, I will go into it a little bit more in detail, but this idea that the objects that you produce and that you see in the world somehow also bear witness to particular histories that are, of course, material, but they're also social, political, or historical. And in my case, I was interested in experimenting with this on a very physical level. I mean, what happens when, instead of just um, going to the material shop, or, I mean, in my case, I, you know, I make installations, so I use a lot of wood and a lot of construction material. But instead of just buying raw wood, we would actually just rip apart an installation of mine and then try and reform that to a new set of functions and to a new space. So it is specific to each situation. You know, the first installation was... Um, the first installation was very specific to the situation there. Being in the gallery, the new gallery at Sol Galata, actually we were installing while the building site was going on, which is not something I would recommend <laughs> uh, to anyone. So specific to that, but also specific to working with three historians who were doing an extensive survey of Turkish archaeology over a certain period of time and um, rooting that survey around a set of objects that came from the Archaeological Museum. So a very particular situation, you know, also of working between a contemporary art institution and an archaeological museum, working with curators and also working with historians who um, deal with very different vocabularies and very different mediums. So situation-specific, 
and then taking it to taking an installation to a completely new situation that of course requires a set of adjustments and a set of new functions. So yeah, I mean in my case this was done very literally with the fantastic team that Asani put together. Um, we drew how to cut these structures apart so that they could be transported to the forum space here and then started from scratch. So started building by ripping something apart and then rebuilding. So this element of, you know, on a very pragmatic level, the fact that any act of creation requires a tremendous amount of destruction. It's just that it's quite rare that that destruction is your own. But yes, that's that was the the, the overall um, act of recycling. Can so. we can we briefly go back to the scramble for the press and maybe you can elaborate a little bit about um, the exhibition design and what makes it as part of your artistic production or as artistic field in the sense that I mean these display structures they are artworks and their own right. Maybe you could talk about that shift yeah. or combination of the things. Okay. Um, I've, I mean, here there's, there's a few images um, of the previous exhibition that uh, I imagine some of you have seen. Um, so, surrounded by in the uninhabitable is the series of studies. I call them studies because they're both things that are studies in the sense that there is a research involved, but I was also dealing with the study as the room in which study happens. So research uh, happens in specific uh, spaces and rooms that I was, I was interested in looking at. So um, in this case, the studies are reconstructions of fragments of other rooms that are studies that have touched me or mocked me particularly in my life. So rooms found or um, existing in the sense that some of them are, it only exists as representations and some of them are real spaces. But um, so for example, this particular structure, the black one that is here, um, was a reconstruction of a part of Darwin's library in Cambridge which is something that I saw probably about eight or nine years ago that kind of really stayed with me because it's, a, it's one of these libraries where in order to get to the place where you can actually sit and work, you have to literally walk through the books. So you go up the staircase completely surrounded by books and then you get to a higher level in which there are no books at all. And that's the place where research happens. So after you've left the reading behind, um, I've got these photographs that were made from uh, uh, by uh, Refik Anadol, who actually might be in the room somewhere, and I've mixed up uh, photographs during the installation and after the installation, also because of this particular relationship between objects. So just to go through the, the study part, then there's, and I'm not going to talk about it in order, because this is perhaps the most recognizable one. Um, this is a reconstruction of the study of St. Jerome, in um, how it appears in a painting by San Antonello, uh, not, he's not a saint actually, Antonello da Messina is a painter, not a saint, yet I suppose. Uh, it's for, it was painted in 1475. So this study doesn't exist as a space in the world, but it is the painted study where the saint sits and works on his translation of the Bible, a Vulgate translation of the Bible. So that is reconstructed here to open up the study of archaeology. I don't know if I want to go through all of them now. Ah, I have a painting here, actually. Maybe some of you have seen it. Um, so the piece of architecture in this case is fictional. It's also quite interesting in how trying to reconstruct this, you understand that it's built according to a particular idea of perspective that is not necessarily that easy to reconstruct. Meaning, trying to reconstruct that precise image, you know, of course, has an element of translation and revision in it. Um, you might also recognize that some of the objects in the painting are actually sitting in and around the vitrines on the objects outside. So we've got a very, very small lion. Saint Jerome has one with a lion <laughs> next to him. Does everybody know the story of Saint Jerome? Should I explain it? Should I explain it? So Saint Jerome 
became a saint because he translated the Bible into Vulgate Latin, meaning, meaning the Latin of every of common people as opposed to scholarly uh, language. Now this act of translation, of course, was also meant also like interpreting the text somehow, but he's always depicted as this really hard-working man who sits in his study and just works and works and revises the Bible. So he um, is also always depicted with a lion. The reason for this is that, so the story goes, right? St. Jerome one day was sitting in his study and a lion walked into the room and he was in pain. And he realized that he had a thorn in his paw. So St. Jerome picked the thorn out of his paw and the lion became his friend forever. And the moral of the story or the idea of the story behind the story is that the intellectual doesn't just take care of knowledge, he also just takes care. He takes care of the world, including the lion. So that's why the lion is there. And when you think about these studies, how do they correspond to the actual um, archival material that they are holding in the exhibition? I mean, because they are creating the context in which the, the viewer sees the, the actual work. Work meaning the, the materials that are selected by the historians. So how would you correspond these two? The studies in the exhibition scramble for the past were almost like a parallel narrative, meaning there was on the one hand the study of archaeology done by um, three um, you know, qualified historians, which is not something I am, I'm not a qualified historian. And then there were these three art commissions um, created pretty much by November and Basel. Yeah. Uh, so M Michael uh, Rapids, uh, Mark Darwin and myself. Um, so I, I became very quickly aware that even though I was going to become familiar with some of the material that formed part of the historical study, I was never going to be an expert on it. I was never going to know it as intimately as they did. So I started to think about the study as a subject in and of itself. So I used these studies to open up the study of the historian, but also to follow a line of thought that's been interesting me for quite a while, which has to do with the relationship between making exhibitions and teaching, you know, the didactic element of making exhibitions. There's a really uncomfortable relationship between art and education um, that sometimes is more or less obvious and that because I'm interested in exhibitions as a medium, literally, you know, I make installations that really have to do with how you put things on display. This relationship is something I've been uh, researching for quite a long time. So, historically, the museum is the other structure for learning. The, there's your university and there's the museum. The university, you go through a curriculum. In the museum, the idea is that you can lead yourself through learning, but that exhibits have to do with being taught. Of course, in contemporary art, this relationship is not so, um, well, yeah, not so comfortable, let's say. Yeah. Maybe also that uh, Celine came into, the, came into the process just about a year before we actually realized the, uh, 14 yeah, months. yeah, 40 months before the exhibition, the, the exhibition opened. So, in a way, there was already more or less a, a kind of a wish list, which would be a checklist. Uh, of works and things and images, etc., etc., which also meant that uh, the, 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 your position was about uh, placing rather than uh, taking a part, taking a, taking a critical part in the you know, in the selection and the selection of objects, and, and that was not yes. your position. So, what the what the uh, what the installation was did was just being inside with or being in tandem with what was uh, what was already uh, what was already the checklist and we want to take this kind of turn uh, I think Malami would probably confirm that we're vehement about not uh, not using the things other than what uh, what they were that is they will not be blown up the images will not be blown up uh, they will yeah. not be turned into posters uh, they would not be kind of adopted to a culture of didactic exhibition uh, process. 
uh, things would be used as uh, in their kind of original state as they as they were, which was a critical turn in terms of this kind of didactics, uh, you know, uh, cultural didactic exhibition. So it was just veering away from that, and we put Celine in a very very difficult, actually complicated position of having uh, not being you not being invented with the project itself, but you've been invited to the project after after it has already taken yes. place, pretty much, yeah. And there's that quite delicate position, which is interesting, but is, is difficult, uh, between making an object in an exhibition that is also the frame for the exhibition. So it's an exhibition display, but it's also a piece. So it has both an autonomous and a totally integrated life. And it creates very uh, complex relationships between object and subject, right? Because what you're looking at, how you're looking at an object, is also mediated through an artistic practice. Um, yes. So maybe here we can. I mean, I, I was thinking about a specific word in the press release that I that is semi-utilitarian, because in the scramble for the class, they they are also semi-utilitarian. I mean, they are artworks in their own right, but at the same time, they do function as display structures. But, but then the int and intentionality of the project changes when it comes to the form area. Um, and um, basically the structures, they do invite people to sit on them, to, to chat around them. So basically they are expected to be inhabited. Um, and maybe that would go back to what you were saying about how they would be recycled or how they would be used. But yeah, and I mean on that front, when we shifted to the forum exactly what this is to follow up from what this is saying the, how do you describe the accumulation when that when uh, the moments are transferred into something that is much more performative here uh, is it much more performative i'm not even sure about that no okay i would say that the act of i mean that it's much more public in the forum, like be taking these things outside the exhibition space and putting them in the space of the forum means putting them much closer to the street and less explicitly making an exhibition of sort. Um, in that sense, I would say that when the structures had to display historical material, their performativity was really inscribed, it was very specific. So the Again, this relationship of being a background for something and explaining and framing what that something was, I would say is a very particular uh, type of performance. Um, but now they're expect I mean, they're waiting to be activated. Yeah. While also, you know, they're going to be, they're going to have the potential to activate the space itself. So I think, I mean, there is a quality of first work performativity in that sense, because I mean, you could always say that they would act as props. Yes, for these informal conversations or for different movements of people. I mean, yeah, this is this is like another um, aspect that I think is quite interesting is this making things public, now making things, putting things in public, which I think is a, again is a very big part of exhibition making, but it's quite rare that you can experiment it with it at at a level that I could do in the form. I mean, it's quite rare to work with a gallery that is quite so open to the public. Uh, I mean, it's basically on the street. Um, and I think here, um, there's, I think there's, there's, there's two different things that are happening here. Is that one, I was really interested in the space of the forum exactly because it is between exhibition space and the street. Meaning, it's not quite the commercial space of the street on the one hand, that has already been inscribed with so many narratives that we all know you know, that have to do with shopping and walking, etc. And it's also not the rarefied space of the exhibitions upstairs, which, you know, this is not a criticism at all, I absolutely am fascinated by exhibition making, but um, exhibition space is also very defined. We know how to behave in exhibition space, right? We know what we're there to do. So the way that one can interact with space is somehow, I wouldn't say limited, but it's framed in a very strong way. Whereas working in the space of the forum is, of course, it's a space in between, but I think the potential for making an installation in there, for me, is to open that space in between and to try and push its boundaries as far away as possible, and in that act, actually, to invent a particular way of dealing with 
installation on the one hand and public space on the other. So um, the reinscription of the structures into this new narrative or this also can only happen in a space like this, right? Because it's about reclaiming a particular space and uh, reappropriating it with an installation. It's a totally diagonal answer. But, but maybe we can also speak about how South Team has scripted the forum space. Because the other day we were having a conversation in which Serene actually make a remark, um, made a remark saying that um, it's not there is this, there's this kind of artificial understanding of using the exhibition space. Um, you use the exhibition, the exhibition starts and then it comes to an end and basically you, um, withdraw, the, you, you withdraw the the works out of the exhibition space, you repaint the walls and then you bring the new work. So there's this kind of a cycle. Whereas in the forum space, uh, I believe that the, the next project is going to recycle the already existing structures that you can see outside right now. I mean, if, if, yeah, maybe we should just backtrack there. Is that the art, the, the, the original, the, let's say, okay, the early idea about the the early about the early idea about uh, utilizing the forum space as the threshold between the inside and outside was that we would commission the the full space uh, to artists, whatever, whoever it may be. Uh, for a duration of six months or nine months or whatever, uh, that would include that would include the uh, uh, code check. That would include the whole, I mean, all of everything that was there. Uh, and then we would change it, and then we would change it again and change it again. And that's kind of this that that the idea of the, uh, this kind of visitor space, the greeting space, the threshold would take different uh, would take different narratives as we went along and they would actually accumulate its own history as as time went on uh, but then with the whole uh, with, you know, with the speed of the construction and, uh, and and deadlines and things pending I personally got uh, I lost the I lost the courage to uh, keep up with that nar narrative and we plugged in a system uh, which was quite uh, which was quite rigid. Uh, on its own for the first few months, and it's the now actually the, the narrative of the forum, uh, delayed as it may be, begins. And the also the interest, I mean, the, not interesting in terms of intentionality, maybe interesting for me, is that Celine was supposed to do the first, uh, uh, the first iterate, uh, the first uh, chapter of doing the forum. So Celine was not. It was let's say disinvited and then reinvited uh, to make the uh, to, you know <laughs> to make the moments the produced moments were scrambled for the past exhibition, which turned out to be even more interesting now for us because and then what's this kind of the accumulation uh, accumulation of the installation of uh, takes a kind of takes a new you know takes a new hole. But the thing about uh, the finishing and completing and closures and all of that is, is actually interesting because that's what we were talking about uh, last a couple of days ago is that we actually close the exhibitions the moment we open them as producers of exhibitions, as curators. You know? Because our fundamental relationship to the exhibitions uh, uh, end. And it op when it opens, it's over. And whereas there, there are other kinds of projects which we do, is uh, the moment it opens is only the beginning of the project, such as the project, like such as 90, such as becoming Istanbul, such as uh, et cetera, et cetera, which then, uh, then, then begins the problem of closure of the exhibition because how do you stop the process? Uh, because the stopping of the process is implied by simply the de deadline of three months or nine weeks or seven weeks or whatever mix it may be that we, we kind of activate a project. So the closure of a project like uh, Becoming Off makes actually much less sense than closure of a project like an exhibition, like, like here. And then as institutions, we go on and on to the next project. Whereas uh, this, you know, what, what, are the, what are the mechanisms of re, you know, revisit, reconsider, return, remake, you can use all the we can use all the we words here. Is we try to do this in other projects, such as you know, uh, um, you know, the, what's the name of the modern series? I forgot. 
modern essays or <laughs> or open you know or open archive etc they are supposed to produce their uh, their kind of lineages and they're supposed to produce their own history so that's yeah, yeah. That's speaking it. about accumulation i have a question for you Zane, because yeah. uh, i i believe that's the first time that you are also exposing a part of your artistic research within the installation that you are producing whereas in the previous works i think um you only yeah. had the, the works and then the, the artistic research part wasn't that visible to, to the viewer. I think I have to explain it a bit, this okay. notion of accumulation okay. and the cumulative. Because it's, um, I mean, it's something I've been working with for quite a long time and I don't necessarily think it's that obvious. Um, and I'm actually going to use a, a series of images for this. Which is here. I'll just use this while I explain it. Um, it really works, I think. Mean. That should work. So, and this, this notion of accumulation comes from a series of projects that I did called Support Structure, which, I mean, I think some of you know me as developing that project, in which uh, um, I was interested in developing or making a project that learns along the way, meaning literally putting a project through a didactic structure. The support structure project was really about, you know, putting on display things like display systems or framing systems or staging systems. And one of the things that I was really working against and that I'm, it's still a really important part of my practice is to work against the artificial sense of erasure that happens at the end of each exhibition. You know, the fact that it's absolutely normative within museums or uh, contemporary art exhibitions, no, actually just g generally exhibitions that at the end of the exhibition, you take everything away, you paint everything white, you erase all traces of the work that has done before in order to make space for the next person to come in. Yeah. I think there's an enormous fatigue that comes out of this artificial sense of erasure. The last phase of the project support structure was the setting up of this space, which is called the Site Project, which is an artist-run space in Birmingham. And what we tried to do was to open an organization, it's literally like a of, you know, gallery space. Thinking of these premises, taking this seriously as a long-term thing. So not just within a project, but as an organization. So that the gallery works in this cumulative way. The first exhibition, which what you're seeing images of now, the first exhibition was actually, well, no, it's a bit more than the first exhibition. The first exhibition was the building site. So we opened with a gallery almost empty, it wasn't totally empty of course, and it never it really is empty, um, but just with an office. And we started by curating the space itself, inviting artists to make artwork that would stay in the gallery. So that the gallery is not just an exhibition in its fabric, but it's also a collection. And that collection is collective. So the work of everybody who has worked in the space is apparent. So this is the empty gallery that we somehow start with. And then everything, including scaffolding or displays or artworks, is put on show. It doesn't mean that everything has to stay, but it means that there is no such thing as the white cube. One, and two, you start having a level of complexity in time and space that is beyond what anybody can control by themselves. So, I mean, I think this is a very obvious way of talking about what I mean by cumulative space. And I think in the case of of salt and the conversation with with Vasip <coughs> in November, you know, those things are perhaps not so obvious, but there are these different timelines that are going on at the same time. So, for example, it's um, for me it was quite interesting to see what was happening with the walls outside. The fact that yes, you can see the exhibitions that have closed as well as the exhibitions that have opened. You know, this is one way of making things present that would otherwise be completely deleted. But of course, the exhibition surrounded by the inhabitant is a particular extreme example of this, where you can look at the installation at face value. It is just a piece of furniture, a set of pieces of furniture outside to, you know, to be used by the public. But if you look at it closely, you can also see how it used to have a different role. So the object itself contains somehow a history. And the fact that that history is inscribed within the history of this particular institution is, um, I think, you know, one step further than this type of accumulation, which is 
um, I think, interesting at this point, especially interesting to me um, in relationship to notions of research and the accumulation and the production of knowledge. So that's going to be my next question in terms of um, how does this notion of time relate to what you're trying to do with sort of research? Good question. <laughs> Um, the, the difficulty within an institution to bring things that are taking place over a long period of time and to be able to show them. So the fact that what you see is not just a product of what happened two weeks ago or two months ago, but there's a really long line of thought of accumulated knowledge, conversations, information, and works. This is something that has to do with research, and it's a very difficult negotiation, I think, within a public institution. So I was wondering how, or, oh yes, how you were thinking about the relationship between salt research and salt exhibitions. Maybe a quick addition to that. Um, the other day we were also speaking about how salt um, announces its programs, and it wasn't about the today there is the, the opening of such and such exhibition, it's rather this week these are the things that are happening at South. So the understanding of seriality, I think it happens at different levels. So that might be one of the things that could relate to your question, if that makes sense. I, mean, I guess certain things are kind of self-evident, some are about our intentionality, which need not be, uh, which should be part of the discussion, I guess, our intentionalities, intentions. Um, but the, uh, the relationship between salt research and salt exhibitions is something we are only now exploring. And it's, that would again go into an issue of intentions, but or goals or aims or whatever they, they may be. It's just about how how you start a project without knowing what the pro how the project should unfold. I mean, this is the first point. You know, you, uh, research to exhibition or research to publication or research to dead end or research to conversation, research to uh, all of those things at the same time or research to uh, basically research to nothing. Uh, any of these things can take shape, uh, should we liberate, should we give us the luxury to liberate ourselves from the pressure of basic exhibition production, because this is not an exhibition institution. Uh, you know, research could unfold in a number of ways, the results of which, I mean, they, it, it could only take shape in process, not in, not at the beginning of the research itself. So I don't, uh, you know, I don't really know. It's. Uh, it's, it's something we hope to attain, we hope to reach, but it's not already there. You know, it's, you can, we can only see parts of this process uh, at the moment, but not in full blossom at this, yeah, at this time. If we can go back to your, your artistic resource setting, um, how, how has it how has your research unfolded through in the last couple of years? Because I think it doesn't it doesn't really only go back to the scramble for the past, but then there's a line of thought that you started a while ago. Yeah. Um, um, surrounded by the uninhabitable, it's not just a recycling of the previous uh, iteration. It's actually a line of thought that starts in 2009 with an exhibition, well, a piece in an exhibition curated by November Painter, and that's a portion at Artist Space in New York, um, which, while it might or might not be obvious, because I, there's actually photographs of it in the installation that you, you might have noticed. Um, so this thing that I was talking about, the relationship between art and education, or my interest in, oh yes, number one. That's why we, we start with number one, right? So that's number one, revision part one. Um, so the art education, the sort of exhibition and learning relationship, you know, this, this kind of thing starts with a piece made in 2009 specifically for this show that was called And the Columns Held, it up, held Us Up, our artist space. 
in which I constructed the study of St. Jerome so for the first time, the first version of the study of St. Jerome, um, made out of cardboard boxes that were like shipping, book shipping boxes. And um, this worked as a book collection point, meaning that before we went there, um, Basif and November contacted, I think, virtually every single institution they could think of, <laughs> and artists that they were interested in, who had books that they wanted for a library in Istanbul, to make an art library in Istanbul. So somebody sat on this chair, and as books were arriving, to either brought by people or through the post, they would be catalogued, put into boxes. The whole installation sat on these things that are actually pallets. So at the end of the show, each box was just closed and taped, and the whole thing was shipped to Istanbul. So all of these books are now in the library at Sol Galata. And there are just two photographs of this installation um, that used to sit with Sezen, the librarian, who you probably all know, and are now replaced in the installation here. So this was like the first, my, my first experimentation with you know, notions of learning. So I looked at learning through the library um, for the first phase. Then I did a, a project that has actually nothing to do with, uh, with, with SOLT that took place in London in 2010 called Revision Part 2, which starts. So from the library, I looked at the art school. So I set up an exhibition that was actually an, an art school. Um, okay, this was actually my proposal. So I made these kind of pieces of furniture that you might recognize. They're like giant versions of the things you sometimes have in, library to, in libraries to reach books that are too high up. Um, that were, when well, the exhibition opened with just these things, it was somehow um, empty, let's say. There were actually seven of them, there's another room that you can't see in these shots. And then after four days, the exhibition was somehow closed to the larger public because it became an art school and there was a three-week art school uh, run by practitioners for practitioners. So in this particular setup of having people teach each other and uh, learn together. Um, and the structures of Revision Part 2 were on wheels and flexible enough that they could be used both to talk in public in a sort of formal way like I'm doing right now, or be used more as, as desks and um, you know, like, whatever, like shelves and things to put on. Um, so, yeah, so the study, the idea of learning and the study through so the library, through the school, and then through the study, and this is the phase of putting the study back in public. So, yes. Does that answer your question? It does, and I have, a, I have an immediate follow-up question. I was thinking about the size specificity of these works. For instance, would you, how, how would this work you know, in the form area would translate into a different context? I mean, I was thinking of actually Liam Gibbock's work, I don't know if that's the correct comparison to make, but Liam Gillick made these um, circular red benches that were part of a show at the Parsons in New York, and basically they provided as a discursive space within the exhibition space. Um, they were a series of, let's say, seating areas. But then he showed me the same work um, in, in a gallery that represents them, and it was like void of its basically exact meaning because there were no people who would activate the space whereas the in the exhibition just sculptures just sculptures but in the in the first exhibition it was it was called democracy in the age of branding i believe it was 2008 and all the all the charrettes and all the workshops they were happening on these on these you know let's say sculptures if you want to call them sculptures i think there's a parallel because you know you could you could also call your sculpture. You could you could say that they are furniture. You could say that they, they are they are part of an architecture, and you could say that these are sculptural objects. So in terms of different contexts, if you want to if you want to think about different spaces, since this one is specifically designed for the forum area, do you think that would translate into other institutions, other venues, other spaces, or does it completely lose its meaning or function since it's semi thin? Um, well, I mean, first of all, I think for me, um, the installations are only interesting if they are all of these things at the same time, meaning I think they are semi-functional in, in the case of, I 
so like from some place like the front desk. So utilitarian and exhibits and a reconfiguration of my previous work. I mean, I think this is what's interesting about it, is that it, it's all of these three things at the same time. It's a support structure, but it's also part of an institution, and it's also an exhibit. Right? So um, it's the, and I, I'm not trying to make things vague here. I think it's exactly the opposite. It's that the fact that objects have different lives. They can do different things at the same time. So I'm interested in this multiplicity of roles on the one hand, and the fact is also that things are functional. Right? To make exhibits that are functional is a, um, well, I mean, it's, it's not particularly a provocation, it's just something I'm interested in. I'm interested in investing objects with functions, and the fact that it doesn't necessarily take things away from artworks, it's an added layer. Right? Um, so that is not exactly an answer to your question, I suppose. Um, the site specificity, I think, is implied in that, in the sense that a functionality has to be specific. It's not necessarily specific to a particular room, but it's specific to a particular situation. And situations are embedded with spatial characteristics, but also very much to do with just social uses, you know, the politics behind things, how something is funded, who's taking care of it. Um, actually, having said this, I have to say that the highest compliment I've had all week about the installation was when one, well, it was yesterday, I think, before the exhibition <laughs> opened as such, so before midday, when the people who were actually working in here were incredibly happy because the front desk had moved and had been reconfigured and it was somehow more fun. So. This was the best compliment I got. It was closer to the street. It's like a lot more fun. Yeah, that was. I kind of really enjoyed that. But so, site specificity for me, it's nothing to do with just the traditional ways of considering a site. It's not just a physical site. It's not just a place. Or rather, a place has all these other layers in it. I prefer to use the term existing conditions which is a way of thinking of site specificity, meaning the conditions that are there before you arrive. And these have to do with, yes, I mean, the shape of something, but they also have to do with just conditions, you know, like how much you're paid and who is working there and who worked there before you. So existing conditions, again, are cumulative, right? So I would like to think of this installation as adjusting and re or transforming the existing conditions of the forum for the next person to work in. Right? So the moment it's open is the moment that it becomes the new existing conditions. And I think this is a particular way of working with the world. Right? That doesn't have to do with erasing things again, but it has to do with working on top of work and therefore allowing previous work to um, you know, on all levels, not just artistic work, right? Just previous work, full stop, to actually be present rather than be repressed. Maybe that could be related to to the film that you're screening outside right now. Um, Go on. It's um, <laughs> no, no, no. okay. okay. <laughs> it's basically a video in yes. which um, Celine makes a makes a list of people, workers, in, including artists who have been part of the ICA in London since 1943, right? 48. 48. Um, Just think about it. It was, I mean, to explain it a little bit, it was, it was one of the support structure works in support of institutions, which was phase six, I think, or something like that. Um, we made a piece um, that had been commissioned by the ICA in London the Institute of Contemporary Arts, which is one of the oldest galleries, and we proposed to make a film of credits that would be showing in the cinema in between films, so when things weren't programmed, that would credit all the people who had been recognized as having worked for the institution, i.e. everybody who got paid and had a contract with the institution since it opened. So that included all the artists who ever showed there, but also all the cleaning ladies, all the technicians, all the curators, and it didn't include people who weren't paid. I mean, sometimes some of the most famous artists don't get paid, right? So then they're not part of the history 
of a particular institution. It's a form of credit. It's called the very simple title of Curtain as Declaration of Change of Function. That's the title. <laughs> I'm not going to explain it. <laughs> you can ask me afterwards if you want to know where it's called like that. Shall we open? One more question. Um, the other day when we were speaking about accumulation and cumulative space, you also mentioned the term translation. And I think it's quite interesting to speak about Messina's painting and Saint Jerome and then his role and then the reason why he's an important saint or what the reason why he became a saint and then the relation between the translation and your work, that you know, how it corresponds to how you're translating, how you're reinscribing new functions to your structures. I love the story. I think we were talking about a book that you were reading. That's how it started. What's the name of this book that you're reading? Here we go, yeah. Electric Cage. Orphan Formation. Yeah. Books. <laughs> Yeah, in parts. What's the story of the book? Oh, <laughs> okay, I have enough uh, sweets. Maybe I can pull this together. It's basically um, it's it's a it's a it's a book edited uh, by one of our colleagues, our uh, design people, Project Projects. It's uh, Adam Michaels, and uh, the book comes out of their publication it's called uh, Inventory Inventory Publications, and this one is this one in particular is about a series of uh, basically three books uh, such as Medium's Message, uh, Marshall McLuhan, another book with uh, uh, Buckminster Fuller and the designers and the particular designers, this particular design group that worked uh, who worked with uh, in the production of these uh, of these books and then what's the most interesting thing is that these books were actually co nearly co-written, co-designed and co-researched uh, by the writer and the designer, so there's not an issue of translating, uh, translating the already finished literature into another medium, the medium of the book, because as you're writing, you're not uh, writing for the book, but you're writing, or when you're when you're when you're collating images, you're only collating images. When you're drawing from existing media, you're only doing that. But it, it's a, it's another translation effort that goes through, which. Uh, which most of the time is, is comes at the end of the process when you deliver it to the designer and, and the designer may translate it in a number of ways could be quite inventive, could be in any form of way but it's at the end of the day it's almost after the product or after the fact or after the research is more or less finished whereas in these projects with uh, that with the electric uh, was it electric age information um, from the late 60s, uh, so from the early 60s until the end of until the end of it's just about a decade that we're talking about where where the designer takes a completely new meaning because uh, they're in on the process on the project from the first moment on. They're actually uh, they actually produce literature, plot literature, invent literature add new literature, add new images, plot images, and, and just work, uh, work with the writer in a, in a completely different set of ways than we expect them to be, which also, for example, which is obviously an example, a, a, a clear example for us to follow as producers too, is, okay, let's not call us producers, um, uh, it's cultural producers, why not? Yeah, I mean, people who, do, who seem to do things, uh, not with their hands. Um, and um, is that you know when is it you know when uh, when is it at what moment in the project we we can actually integrate uh, integrate the project when does the interpretation and education come in when does thinking come in when does the when is the designer coming in when is the web person coming in when is when are the people who orig who have the original whatever idea uh, and how to how to turn that into a different process so that the whole authorship is also uh, is quite completely different than a traditional way of making exhibitions or making projects or, or putting out you know putting out these things into the world. Yeah. So I mean it's it's a it's a different form of translation that, that you were thinking of. Yeah, yeah and, um, I re no I, re I remember how that story for me made me 
reminded me of how much more interesting that is than to think about interdisciplinarity. Right? Because that's not about interdisciplinarity. Right? We're, we're talking about a designer, a thinker, a writer, and a publisher working together on something that is a new object of knowledge. Yeah, it's not design or publishing, but it's all of these things at the same time. And it's because it's a new object of knowledge that then it means that there's somehow further room to claim, I think. Um, I mean, for me, that's, a, that's quite an interesting thing in relationship to the forum. You know, again, this idea of creating new spaces that are not yet completely defined, because that is the only way to have possibilities to think a little bit further than what we already know. Um, and also now I understand why you asked me about the translation. Because, uh, yes, of course, well, I mean, that's what the saint is doing, right? The saint Jerome sits there and translates the Bible. So what he's doing, effectively, is, is two things. On the one hand, he's taking this book, which was already old by the time he was um, alive, and making it present again. Yeah? By translating it, he makes it, he brings it into the present, and reinterprets it, which means that he links it back to his present. And then on the other hand, by making it into a language that people can understand, Vulgate Latin, I mean, you could say, of course, especially in this conversation between high art and low art, you know, is that it's making it less valuable than it is. But it's exactly the opposite. He's putting it into common life. He's integrating this book into everyday life. And I think, I mean, this is what attracts me so much about this work. Because St. Jerome is the patron saint of intellectuals, but he protects, well, most people in here, I suppose, would qualify as intellectuals. He's the one saint we have, right? There's no other ones. So wh why, what does it mean is that the saint protects intellectuals not by protecting intellectual work, by removing it, by making it this higher work. Exactly the opposite. It protects the intellectual by rooting intellectual work into everyday life, right? So this idea of commonality, the fact that intellectual labor is part of the building of the world, I think is incredibly reassuring and incredibly beautiful as well, as a way of you know, restituting the work to yeah, the world and uh, common, the common, let's say. And that relates to the way that you're domesticating the furniture in the, in the forest. Yeah, I mean, it re on, on, again, on two levels, you know, first of all, the, the displays themselves, the fact that taking the structures and making them domesticable, that's probably not a word, but habitable, let's say. So changing structures so that they can be habited, so that you can actually sit on them and use them. So that's one way. <coughs> and then the other thing is, of course, the forum. is taking the space and adjusting it, trying to tackle what it's not doing and should or could be doing in order to make it more habitable, so that perhaps more people come in from the street, but it's also perhaps that people who come out of the exhibitions have a place to stop. So it's really reoccupying the space in between. So both on the formal level of the objects and also on the level of the site, in terms of where this is happening. Yeah. Um, I could open. Um, there's a couple of things I didn't say, but you're no one. Like where all of these studies come from. I only talked about one or two, I think. You know, like this fragments outside. This is actually a photograph of a, a sketch by Michelangelo. This was one of the very first public libraries. I don't have a picture of it, I just have the sketch. Uh, one of the very first public libraries, as far as I understand, that opened in the world, and it's the Medici Library in Florence, uh, which is the city where I grew up as a child, so I, I was familiar with this place from quite early on. And he designed these weird puppets where, yeah, the back of the seat is what the person behind you is looking at something. I mean, I guess it makes sense if you look at this, right? But the amazing thing about them is that there were not so many books at the time, so the books were actually chained to it. So it wasn't the books that changed tables, it was people who went from one table to the other to read particular books. <coughs> so this is a Medish library, like a place of study. Was this um, this is 15th century, 15th century, Renaissance Italy. This is actually the archaeological, well, the library or in the archaeological museum here in Istanbul, which is a really absolutely wonderful space where Denise took me, uh, I think, two years ago to sign up. Um, 
what should I go to? Oh, maybe this last one. The, the architects in the room would remember this. This is um, a, a working table that Le Corbusier designed for himself in the house that he designed for it. It was made for his parents by Lake Geneva, and it was an outdoor desk. So just by the lake, but just with that little window, so it would actually frame the view. Like just a room without a roof, basically. Are there any questions? It was, it was quiet, so I, I thought I'd ask a question, but I'm not sure if this is a question or, or maybe an observation. Um, when you brought I, when you brought up the the sort of curriculum within the, the university, the curriculum's root word is is cur curricula or something along those lines that means to to move quickly through something. So so a curriculum within the context of the, of the university means to like move quickly through a set of information or, or kind of knowledge. Um, and you kind of distinguished the university from what takes place in in the exhibition or let's say the museum, but that maybe is something that's actually carried over it's similar, but the sort of movement through the space is essential to how an exhibition works, right? That's one of the fundamental things is people kind of like moving through the space in some particular way that the curators kind of designate or articulate, or the, or the people who are programming the space, the architects, etc. The two, two of the projects, both, both out here and then the, the art school that you showed, um, the art school project, both actually obstruct Flow, right. So within the context of the art exhibition, they they actually people can't go into the to the installation space, right? It becomes something out, something else. And here, these last week, it was kind of flow. It was a flow. Is a transitory space between outside and the rest of the rest of the building, whether it be here or the exhibitions. But now that sort of that kind of movement through the space is, is obstructed. Um, at least from my sense, it's kind of circuitous, and it's, you can kind of move move around, and then you just said that like it's a place where people can now sit, which also resists the kind of um, what the exhibition is supposed to do, which is make people move, move through it. So I guess there's two, two questions. One is, is this issue of obstruction, and maybe that's not the total word, the totally right word, but that feels to me what's kind of happening, or this kind of stoppage, or the kind of non-conductivity or the kind of non-movement that you're doing here. You're sort of stopping a kind of flow within the within the installation space, the exhibition space, and if that's true or not true or what you what you think about that. And that also sort of counters um, actually no, I'll just stop there because that's that's maybe enough to talk about. So this issue of kind of like obstruction, because I guess I guess the point is is that if you took a kind of seating environment and you placed it in a classroom, it wouldn't be strange. Right, you, you wouldn't be obstructing anything if you put seating into a classroom or, or, or into a site of learning. So what you're doing is actually you're sort of stopping a kind of movement within the exhibition. So this, it's, it's particularly related to this context in a way that it wouldn't make sense within a space that that's what you were already supposed to be, be doing. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's interesting that because I, I never thought about it as obstruction. I, you know, that word is not something that ever came to mind, but of course it does make sense that that would be picked up because I suppose I'm requiring, well, I mean, I think part of what the project demands and, you know, my sort of larger project support structure definitely demands that is that you do not take for granted exactly those things that you normally take for granted. And therefore that you do have to sometimes stop and look at those things. Right? Um, first of all, because, you know, not just because these things are important, but because these things provide the conditions for the space. So um, the, this can be seen as an obstruction, of course, because it, it prevents you from taking things for granted. Um, I mean, sometimes successfully, sometimes not successfully, I should say. But um, more than obstruction, I think it's perhaps, in my case, I thought about it perhaps more as an interruption or just, again, opening up those spaces that I don't necessarily think didn't exist before. 
but by paying attention to something anew, or perhaps for the first time, I think you're just stretching it. You're changing the boundaries of it. Now, it doesn't mean that you're not going to do what you're going to do afterwards anyway. You might do it, out, but you, it might just take that little bit longer. Um, and then that, I think, that new space that you open up is a space of potential, of course. This is, in my case, you know, it's literally what I chose to be the site of my practice. That's where I work. It doesn't necessarily mean that I know what I'm doing, but it means that that's where I work, right? In that space that you normally take for granted. Um, for example, the framing device, right? Which is the thing that as an artist you normally don't do. Um, so obstruction to a particular set of blindness or blindnesses, yes, I would say that's a really interesting work for me. Because the flip side of the argument is that you're creating, you're, you're not only reconfiguring, but you're also creating space in relation to bodies. So that would be the other side of the coin, I guess. So it's more about production and creating rather than obstructing in my opinion. Or how I see it. Any other questions? Fantastic. So, <laughs> yeah, it looks very lighthearted and less serious than it was in Scrabble. Um, well, one question. I'm curious what will happen to those structures after Uninhabitable is over, because it's about the process. And also, in terms of the process, again, I find it interesting, and if you can talk about it a little bit more, because I know you had like weird working hours while you were installing this. So it was like process was half exposed to the public, I guess, because that what happened. So how it affected the work also, I mean, you may do some stuff. It wasn't all planned like scramble. Mm. So yeah, if you can talk about the process of making this installation. Um, yeah, but now that was the very first part of your question. What was the first part? What? Oh, what's happening next? Yeah, that's very important, actually. You should say that um, Meric, who might be here, so then, Meric Turner has uh, already we yeah. talked to me about the fact that she was interested in inviting this group called Rotor, who are based in Brussels. And um, we were talking about the potential for Something that I think is really exciting is that possibly what's happening in the forum is like a, a new line of thought, a new way to program things somehow, um, <coughs> in which the next group who takes over the installation and also further recycles them, so that this reconfiguration is perhaps something that can open new possibilities for new groups. I mean, you know, I don't necessarily think it's so easy to find people who are willing to do that. But it is quite an interesting question, you know. So what happens if you're invited to work on top of someone else's work? So I'm hoping that this is an, another way of, 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 of going about the conversation. I'm, I'm certainly very interested in this. You know, if I take my installation as raw material, it would be really interesting if, if somebody else does the same, and then someone else after that, and then someone else after that, and then perhaps it's completely unrecognizable. Um, that's the first thing. Then in terms of process, um, yes, I mean, it's it's interesting to me, again, I've never done this before, the recycling thing, right? So what's interesting to me is that I normally work with drawings a lot. And when you're recycling and reconfiguring, you can't work with drawings. It just doesn't work because you have to, you, know, you can't draw that something's being cut up and then you have two parts that you then build something with. And right? it's completely pointless to work with drawings. So I work with models. Um, so remodeling the previous exhibition and then cutting it up and remaking it. But of course, I could only have somehow like a vague outline of what I was going to do. A lot I knew could only happen 
in the gallery, sitting there with Sani and the guys and tools and feeling the space and seeing what happened. I mean, this, you know, to say it's like it's quite a scary process actually because it's just so big and there was so much wood. You know, when we carried everything over here, it was just the form was full of wood. And then, you know, like, what the hell do you do? I mean, you make a bonfire, you know, like, <laughs> it's like so much stuff. But, um, and of course we had to throw some stuff away, but um, working with wood is really noisy and really dusty. Also, it's not even wood, most of it is MDS. It's like the worst stuff. It's basically like breathing glue. So we could only really make noise, especially at the weekends, we could only make noise before or after the institution was closed. So before 12 and after 8 which is not a good working schedule. Um, so, but yes, I mean, somehow embedded in the process are those difficulties, right? You're working completely in public, and then you're also working with recycling your own work, which means you have to think on your feet. You know, there has to be an element of improvisation. Also in terms of uh, testing things, um, sitting on things and looking at them and spending some time with them and then changing your mind. Uh, which is always nerve-wracking, but I think quite an important part of the process. But I think maybe there's no questions, we should just stop. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. There's a point in here. You know, I just wanted to use the word generosity. It's not really a question, it's more uh, just a feeling that I'm in getting them all the way through. There is something that's very generous about your work. That you allow it Can you speak up? Is this working? Hello, I'm, hello. This is working. Yes. No, I, I started off by saying it's the word generosity that I feel when I'm thinking about looking at your work, that, that you are open to so many possibilities that stretch out into both the public and the private, that you create situations that are about thinking inwardly and about flow between outside and inside and you're prepared that these structures can continue in a way that well, I'm thinking all about destruction and recreation that it seems that there is an, there's an infinite possibility that you're prepared to be to, to, to step back from authorship as well in a certain way that I think is, is very generous in that respect. Yes. That's very sweet but I also have to add something that is that <laughs> Projects like this just don't happen by themselves, you know, it only happens if you have a relationship with somebody who runs an institution who is willing to make an experiment like that over a long time as well. And I think that's where the legacy or the, the you know, the history of the project itself is, I think, important. That it only works because we started working together in 2009 and there's a particular way of taking a process um, through, meaning that you have to be invited in a particular way as well. Um, it's actually yeah. interesting because there could be another, I mean, there's another kind of a narrative, and a, and another narrative, another line here, a kind of cross narrative which could be read in tandem, which is another project we did. It's because John, you're here, Altai. Um, with the normalization process back in 2005, which where it was a series of it was a series of three exhibitions which folded uh, each time the exhibition would close. When the first exhibition closed, John folded the uh, first exhibition into the second exhibition, and then when the second exhibition closed, he folded the first exhibition and the second exhibition into the third exhibition, which then he folded all of them together kind of upgraded the material and everything in, in, in Taipei during the 2010 Taipei Biennial uh, where in between sandwich panels all the story, all the history of this kind of folding took place and those panels are now actually upstairs uh, in, the, in the kind of temporary office area working as separators um, and also kind of a living memory of the institution and I was always thinking of like what would happen if we took them down again, which would not make any sense, obviously, because there's no anchor anymore to the images, because the space is completely transformed, and then it's it's and and this kind of folding, 
you know, uh, folding of one exhibition to the uh, into the other, and then your folding or and your not folding, but your your collapsing and and, and, and uh, What does folding actually imply? Like literally folding, you know, packing something into something else and packing it into something else. Yeah. Okay, but. Uh, if there are no more questions, uh, we can just turn around the space as well and thank you all for coming and I'd also like to thank uh, the British Council, this has made this long relationship possible. Thank you, thank you for coming, thank you so much, thank you. Everyone.